Hello, everybody. Hi. Hello. Welcome to History Check. Uh, my name is Meredith Gerber. I am the drive through RPG Century Publisher Relations Representative, and I am here with my special guest, Eddie. Eddie Hello. Webb, can you tell people, introduce yourself? Who are you? Yes, uh, my name is Eddie Webb. My pronouns are he, him. I am the owner of Pugsteady, which creator of the Realms of Pugmire, and I am the in-house developer for Onyx Path Publishing, and I also freelance in a lot of places, including the recently uh, inadvertently announced uh, Transformers RPG, so that's fine. Congratulations! <laughs> You're ready Thank to you. roll out? Yes, I am ready to roll out. <laughs> so many options um, prime puns. <laughs> and thank you for um, noting your pronouns. My pronouns are she, her. Um, and I want to give special thanks to Lisa. Lisa is our tech wizard who Lisa. is behind the scenes. Uh, so Lisa, thank you so, so much uh, for getting this set up for us. Um, so we're going to get right into it. Uh, if this is your first yes. history check, what this is, is uh, Eddie and I are uh, very old friends and colleagues and uh, Eddie has a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of knowledge on the history of the industry. And this is just a very cool way to kind of go over the different parts of history in our industry. Um, except the difference is, is instead of going over the big pieces, which we highly recommend you check out uh, Designers and Dragons, um, mm -hmm. that covers a whole boatload of history. Um, we're kind of going more into the not talked about uh, books and RPGs and publishers. Uh, so that is what we're doing here. And it's gonna be very fun. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's gonna be interview style. Um, so Eddie and Eddie's done deep research. I've done so-so research. Um, so, um, I did the hard just, work and Mary was like, yeah, sure. We'll just skate along. Yeah, on. whatever, <laughs> man. It's fine. We got it. Um, so, I glanced yeah. at the Wikipedia page. <laughs> <laughs> I glanced at it. I know where it is in drive through uh, I know who the publisher is. Yeah. Um, and it makes it available to um, essentially have it where we are able to uh, talk in a way that Eddie shows his knowledge, um, mm -hmm. whereas I'm not like, hey, I already know this. So it's a learning process for all of us, and I'm really, really excited. So exactly, yeah. So this week we are going to be talking about what Eddie. Um, we are going to be talking about uh, the Mechanoid Invasion, which is the first RPG created by Palladium. Ooh, awesome. Okay, so. Um, first and foremost, we mentioned Designers and Dragons. Um, they actually have a specific section about Palladium uh, from the 80s. So if you are looking to dive more into this, um, we definitely suggest uh, checking that out. Mm -hmm. uh, that is on drive through. I will put it in the link below as well. Um, so we will get over to that. Uh, Eddie, can you tell me what was the 80s like for tabletop RPGs? Uh, so... Um... Uh, one of the things that uh, we, we've been talking about a little bit is kind of showing the, the progression uh, through the time period. Like uh, we did Bunnings and Burrows, which is 76. Um, Mechanoid Invasion is 81. So uh, it's not quite the heyday of 80s tabletop RPGs, which is why I thought this is a good kind of stopping point to look at it again. It's it's really the late 70s in a lot of ways. The, the boom of gaming is just on the horizon. Like literally this is the year where a lot of big steps are made. Um, this is the year that um, Call of Cthulhu and Champions launch, for example, along with uh, the Mechano Invasion. So uh, the industry as we understand it from the 80s is just on the horizon. Um, but uh, even in spite of that, there's some things that are already changing and some things that have been inherited from the 70s. Uh, uh, one of them is that games are really still co very complicated at this stage. The idea uh, of of, intro of uh, sorry introductory games isn't really coming until about eighty three with the introduction of uh, the Red Box Dungeons and Dragons set. Um, so that's one of the reasons why Bunnies and Burrows last time we looked at was is interesting kind of aberration because it was a relatively light game, but it was not typical of the 70s design ethos. This one's going to be a lot closer to the more common way that games are designed. They're, they're very intricate. They're very what we would call crunchy today. Um, 
The other thing is that um, settings are very loosely defined, and we did see that last week or last month in uh, Bunnings and Burrows, but settings are more implied than explicitly spelled out. Um, and I want to dig more into this when we get into the meat of, of macro invasion, but we're starting to see a little bit of a shift towards explaining what the setting is, but it's still very, very light and loose. It is expected that people are bringing their own settings and their own ideas to the table rather than purchasing a setting and implementing it. Uh, and then the other thing that's, that's really noteworthy, particularly in the context of macro invasion, is that military gaming was huge at this time. Um, this is uh, Twilight 2000. This is a lot of post-apocalyptic gaming. Um, the, 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 there's a Vietnam era game that comes out around this time period. Um, and then it goes away really fast. It was like a very large genre for about six or seven years in the 80s. And it's one that we don't see hardly anything of since. Uh, so uh, you're going to see elements of this, this military aesthetic and this military uh, genre showing up in in this product so those are kind of the big pieces of this uh, uh long tail 70s early 80s time period okay awesome so yeah definitely seeing that shift when you say military i always immediately think of wargaming um and yeah. like it's so like that's and that's still very very big currently um mm -hmm. wargaming is huge um we have right. a sister site, Wargaming Vault. Like it's it's packed with stuff. So yeah, yeah, Wargaming is still very popular. Um, mm -hmm. We're at a stage in the industry where re role playing games are starting to get its own identity, but it's still carrying a lot of baggage from its wargaming roots. But what's interesting is that a lot of the wargaming roots for early parts of the game uh, were, were fantasy based, but also. Um, older military wargaming so it's your napoleonic wargaming was a huge influence for example um uh, english civil war wargaming that kind of stuff is very popular modern military wargaming wasn't quite as big uh, world war ii military wargaming was still pretty big but that was about it um that's going to come on the uprise a long step with tabletop role-playing game in the early 80s so those two things are going to kind of actually swell a little bit together particularly with a uh, squad leader um, and we're not going to go into war gaming so much, but um, Squad Leader, Advanced Squad Leader comes out about this time, and that's where the huge uptick in military war gaming happens and military tabletop role playing because they're still pretty cleaved together in the popular consciousness and also in the design era. Um, so the, it, there's a bit of ebb and sway with both of those and, until uh, really, I think, 82, 83, when then uh, tabletop starts taking its own identity and really more firmly moving away from war gaming as a whole. So um what other titles were popular during this time um so dungeon dragons of course uh was popular it was um already becoming the inner pound gorilla of tabletop role-playing games um a lot of tabletop game designs from the late 70s to the early 80s are almost all exclusive or not exclusively almost all refutations of or attempts to do better versions of D D. Uh, so anything you see on the game is going to be basically referencing in some way the design of Dungeons and Dragons. Even if they're trying to do something completely different than Dungeons and Dragons, you can see we're not D&D in this way. Um, the other one that's really big is Traveler. Um, again, much like uh, military gaming, hard sci-fi gaming is very popular at this stage, um, but it doesn't nearly fade as hard or vice versa, peak as fast as military uh, tabletop gaming. So um, hard sci-fi is, is earlier than this, uh, late 70s is when Traveler becomes popular, 79, I want to say. Um, and Traveler stays on for a good long time, and other hard sci-fi games pop in and out throughout. It's never quite as popular as fantasy gaming, um, but it, it is for a long time a solid second, and eventually becomes like a third and fourth as like superhero games uh, and, and horror games come up. Um, and speaking of which, like I mentioned before, Champions and Call of Cthulhu coming out the same year as this game. Um, so uh, even though both horror and superhero games existed before, and uh, Villains of Vigilantes did come out before Champions and um, Superhero 2048, I want to say. I have a blank on the year. Um, was actually the first superhero role-playing game. So there are superhero games before this, but Champions is when it really makes superhero role-playing and puts it on the map. Um, and same with Call of Cthulhu. It is still in many ways the iconic horror role-playing game. Um, so the idea that you could do more than just fantasy and sci-fi is new at this stage. So, so we're seeing in 81 
uh, an ex expansion of what a tabletop game could be. Okay. Awesome. Very cool. So um, that being said, um, we're going to jump into it. Who mm -hmm. is Palladium? Uh, so Palladium Games um, was created by a man named Kevin Sambita in 1981. Um, and you're going to see some similarities of his this company's creation com compared to what we did last month. Um, uh, first of all, it was uh, spun out of a group known as uh, Detroit Gaming Center, or DGC, in 1979. Um, and Detroit was one of a relatively strong upswell of tabletop gaming, particularly the Midwest in the 70s was actually pretty big for tabletop gaming as a whole. Um, uh, uh, it spread from, obviously, the uh, Lake Geneva era, area uh, where TSR started, um, but still uh, the the Midwest is a big area for it. And I think it's partially because uh, tabletop board gaming, like I said, was very popular in the Midwest. Uh, but also um, my personal theory is that um, tabletop gaming is a relatively cheap hobby. And uh, in the Midwest, it's something that's people without a lot of money could invest in and get a lot of enjoyment out of as opposed to more expensive popular culture options at the time. I think it's still true, um, but going to get friends together for a long tabletop game makes a certain amount of more financial sense than, you know, going on a road trip or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, a lot of it came down to, he was starting to, uh, Kevin was starting to modify his own games uh, based on, um, Things that he was dissatisfied with Dungeons and Dragons, uh, and he uh, was running a fantasy campaign that was the Palladium campaign setting. Uh, and his friends kept telling him, "You need to publish this. You need to publish this. You need to publish this." Uh, so he actually submitted his ideas to TSR, uh, which were rejected. Um, he submitted his ideas to Judges Guild as well as some other kind of third-party um, publishers, uh, and. and Again, late seventies is a very different perspective on how intellectual property worked. Um, so, third-party publishers were a lot had a much freer hand. Even though TSR is at this stage in eighty one, starting to look at clamping down on them. Um, but you could go to another company, Judges Guild, and theoretically publish official D and D books effectively, um, even though they were there for use with Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so Judges Guild did make him an offer, which, uh, according to his own words, was a terrible offer. Um, and so uh, that got him freelance work. <laughs> <laughs> um, Judges Guild is like, I don't want, I don't want you to buy my game, but I'm willing to do work for you. So he actually did do uh, freelance work for uh, Judges Guild, Steve Jackson, and Faza, who are some of the bigger non-TSR companies that were growing up around this time period. Mm -hmm. um, but he still kept his own ideas for himself, and said he wanted to try to do them himself. Uh, um, and so I believe his freelance experience certainly helped him to get a sense of how to actually make a professional product. Uh, and uh, uh, Palladium is really interesting from a historic perspective for a couple of reasons. Uh, uh, one is that it is one of the rare companies that are still around today that are so heavily shaped by its owner and creative director at every level. I mean, really, Palladium Games is Kevin Zambita, uh, and that's still true today. Uh, and so there are still Palladium products, Palladium books being made today. Uh, and if you like those kinds of games, he can provide those to you and has provided those for decades. Um, the other is that uh, unlike companies like, say, Steve Jackson, which are also very heavily shaped by its owner and uh, creative director, um, the games haven't changed substantially from their origin. Um, if you picked up the latest Rifts book that came out last year, it's going to look and feel pretty similar to the Mechron Invasion, which we're going to look at now, uh, which came out in 1981. And more specifically, uh, to be clear, um, we're looking at the version that was put together in the Mechron Invasion trilogy that came out a number of years later. Um, so there has been some reformatting uh, that occurred as a result of this. Um, I try to keep my commentary focused on just the ones that I know explicitly are from the original 1981 material. Um, and Kevin Sabita, in the introduction to the trilogy, he does talk about the history of the, the Mechanization, which is used, hugely helpful for this. Um, but he also says that he did make some updates because he wanted to offer people compatibility to put this into the more modern Palladium games. But he also said he did not want to mess things too much because people, people felt like they wanted this historical artifact. If you do a search for 
uh, Mechanoid Invasion Riffs book, that really is his update of this material into Riffs, which was at that time his, his current and modern setting from his perspective. Um, so we're looking at specific kind of the origins of both the Palladium house system, and again, this is one of the first house systems we had, and also what decisions Kevin made in 81 and why he made those decisions, and then how those kind of saw him through into today. Awesome. Very cool. And as you mentioned with Palladium, like they, yeah, they are a hundred percent still around. They're consistently putting books out. Um, riffs, like you mentioned, being the big thing um, in, in current times, uh, mm -hmm. which is cool to see it evolve. So yeah, absolutely. All right. So we talked about Palladium. Let's talk about the invasion. Um, what is it? So the conceit of the Mechanoid Invasion, uh, like I said previously, setting was pretty loosely defined. Um, so the first book uh, is is centered around a, uh, a powerful, malevolent race um, of bio-driven machines uh, known as the Mechanoids that invade a planet called Gideon E. Gideon E was colonized by humans some indeterminate number of years prior, and now they're being attacked by these uh, biomechanical aliens question mark um that are invading the planet and that's pretty much the setting mm -hmm. um what's interesting about this game uh actually if you don't mind i'm just gonna go diving into what i find interesting about this um the first book the micro invasion was only 60 pages it was a comic book sized book and it sold for at the time three dollars 75 cents which is actually even if you count for inflation is still extremely cheap for a core rule book mm -hmm. um but also it was explicitly created to be the part of a trilogy, and each subsequent book of the trilogy, which we'll get to later, but um, they built on the plot of the previous books. So it's a really good example of a meta plot book and probably the first example of a game that actually introduced the concept of meta plot, the idea that there are plot elements that carry over to different games, and each of those games advances the time of the story between books. So we're seeing that kind of real early nascent example of, of meta plot. Um, but yet the first book is meant to be self-contained. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's the you, you roll up characters uh, who are the colonists of this uh, Gideon E and um, the mechanoids invade and you deal with that. And that's pretty much the game. Awesome. Okay. So... As we ask every time on our uh, history checks, what makes it special? This is the part I love because it allows me to babble for a good long time. Hey, I'm into it. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why I'm here is listen to Eddie hey, babble for 45 minutes. It's awesome. Minutes. You're so knowledgeable. <laughs> what a cool game. <laughs> um, but there's actually a, a lot that's really interesting about uh, the Mechanoid Innovation. Uh, I want to start by saying that. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, the Palladium system is controversial uh, to a lot of modern gamers. Um, you either love it or you hate it, and there's not very many people who stand in the middle. Um, but uh, so I don't want to talk too much about the relative merits of the game from a modern perspective, at least to start. I want to talk about kind of the the the, the, 80, the context of this game coming in 81 and what it's doing and saying. Um, and one of the first is that uh, this is actually one of the earliest examples of what we now call a house system. Uh, and a house system, for those who don't know, is when a company makes a game and each subsequent game after that uses the same or very similar mechanics, even if that game is not thematically or plot-wise connected to the previous game. Um, so within, the, within a couple of years, the Macro Invasion comes out. Of course, each game is the same system because they're connected, but when this becomes uh, Palladium Fantasy, when this becomes Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, when this becomes Rifts, it uses a, a derivation of this system. So people who've played one of the games, may have Palladium, can pick up the other games and be reasonably sure to understand that this game's going to work in some other way. Um, and so you're seeing the genesis of not generic games like GURPS, but more... more House systems like uh, Chaosium's BRP, um, which was started in, uh, even before Call of Cthulhu, or, or the Hero System, which was started in Champions. So 81 is kind of the birth of the house system in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and this is a good non-traditional point to kind of look at that concept. 
the other is that it is, unlike BRP and unlike Hero System, still very heavily inspired by old school Dungeons and Dragons. Um, the, uh, uh, whereas Bunnies and Burrows kind of threw everything out a lot of ways. And you could still, you had to kind of dig deep into the game to start to see those old school D&D references. Here, they're much more on the surface. You have attributes that you roll with three dice, six dice. Um, you have a defense score, which is very similar to armor class. You roll a d20 to attack somebody. Um, you have, uh, you know, points there, uh, hit, like hit points that you have to, well, called damage capacity that you lose and reduce. Um, if your character has a certain amount of points in your attribute, you get an attribute bonus. Uh, you have a, f a very uh, a similar array of dice for, you know, D4, D6, D8, D10, D12, all those. Um, so if you had played um, Dungeons & Dragons or Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, which I think has just come out, um, and you move to Palladium, a lot of this game is, like I said before, a refutation of D&D. Here's ways to do what they believe to be D&D better. Uh, so as a result, there are some interesting differences, uh, one of which is that um, for people who are relatively new to Dungeons & Dragons or played D&D in the 21st century, which is more accurate, um, it may be surprising to learn that Dungeons & Dragons didn't really have a skill system until 3rd edition. Um, and this is a game that kind of goes really far the opposite route. It has a very detailed skill system. There are lots and lots and lots of skills, um, which are very uh, nitty gritty. Um, so uh, any kind of concept can have a, a skill associated with it, and they are percentile based. So um, similar to old school D&D, uh, each system is not homogenous. It's not stemming from a core resolution, but each one's kind of bolted on. So um, you have... Uh, percentages you roll, you roll skills and percentages you roll against attributes with uh, 3d6 you roll uh, attacks d20 each system has its own slightly different way of handling things uh but again this is the point where skills becoming a part of game design it's really starting in places like here like call of cthulhu like uh, uh, champions this is 81 is the point where this is really becoming a big design idea um, also, I have what we call non vancian spell system, which is a really, really obscure way of describing spells that aren't D&D spells. D&D um, spells uh, are called Vancean because they came from a writer who had made the concept of uh, wizards memorize spells and want to cast them disappear from their memory. It came from a writer named Vance. And so D&D derived its concept from those novels. Um, this is something we now see is actually a much more common spell system, which is kind of a mana system, what we call. Um, but in this case, it's a, a, a mental capacity, um, ISP, oh, sorry, internal strength points. That was it. Um, so you spend these inner strength points, and then when you spend enough points, you can use a, it's a spell. I mean, they're psychic powers, but they're basically work identical spells from D and D. But as opposed to memorizing it and forgetting it, you just spend a number of points and you keep casting these effects until you run out of points and that's something that uh as video games are starting to adapt tabletop role-playing games into their own settings we see that a lot more in video games so it's much easier to program minus 20 points than it is to memorize remove um as D, &D video games come on board they start adapting that but non D, &D adaptive video games like your final fantasy dragon warriors just use a mana point system um and so you're seeing uh, again this is a good example of the kinds of design thoughts happening in the sphere as a whole because it's a reputation of how D, &D does things uh and um also again one of those weird points that you can see that uh shows you it's it's where it's coming from is that it has explicit alignments uh but a um, the alignments, as opposed to neutral, uh, have things like selfish. Uh, so it's clearly attempt to try to make the alignment system something that's a little more uh, understandable to the designers, at least, and to the players that are excited by these kinds of games. But also, weirdly, and showing um, the fact that this is still a first product, uh, alignments are referenced in this first book, but do not appear. The rules do not appear in the first book. Nor do they appear in the follow-up <laughs> They, in fact, only the third book of the trilogy actually goes, oh, by the way, here's the actual alignments. So alignments exist, 
but because they're outside the scope of we set ourselves, we're actually not going to talk about them because they were forgotten for two subsequent books, which having forgotten entire subsystems and games I've designed, I sympathize with to a degree. I have certainly gotten books to editing. It's like, oh, I forgot to write this. It's a very important subsystem. And then Dixie Cochran, my editor, gets mad at me because I have to send her another like 20 pages of materials I forgot to put in. So I, I, I feel Kevin on this, but it is just kind of humorous that this is one area where we can point to and say, this is how Palladium differs, but we can't actually talk about it in this exact product. Um, but uh, to kind of... Uh, 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 one of the things that's interesting about the mechanism invasion specifically is that you can see more explicitly how this is a trying to really attack Dungeons & Dragons. I'm not just saying that. Uh, we saw that a little bit in Buddies and Burrows, but um, there are some very bolted-on mechanics uh on here. So uh, Dodge is an example, uh, page uh, 17 of the trilogy. Um, dodging is something that isn't really possible in D&D. And so there's an interesting attempt to try to resolve this, uh, where is um, uh, if I roll to attack you and I roll really well, um, I can make a dodge roll by just rolling a d20. And if my number happens to be higher than yours, then I dodge. Um, it There's nothing that's added to it. It's just kind of a random chance thing. But it does give a player being attack agency, which appears to be what the concern is. And uh, I only say it appears to be because other parts of the book are so explicit about why decisions are made. Uh, Kevin's voice is very, very strong here. Again, we saw this in Bunnies and Burrows, um, but it was then like our play tests have shown blah. It was a little more abstracted. There was kind of a behind the scenes talk interwoven in there, which was something we haven't seen in a very long time. Uh, but this one is more explicit. Um, uh, for example, on page 16, uh, they're talking about incapacitation. Uh, and there's a little quote here, it's like, uh, quote, it would be silly to have the role to see if a character can hit and penetrate the armor rating of the person he is sitting on. Um, so it's like, he's like, it would be silly if this was the case. I mean, it, he's explicitly saying that. Uh, similarly, um, on page uh, 18, we he's talking about uh, the occupational character classes. Um, it's a quote, I originally had 17 different character classes. As I developed the mechanoid scenario, it became painfully apparent that many of the characters did not have highly playable abilities in the battle situation I've set up. As a result, I decided on seven character classes with the greatest playability, unquote. Um, so the idea that the designer is telling you, here's why I made these decisions, indicates that, A, this is still a pretty small community. Again, we're not quite to the boom of tabletop RPGs yet. Um, so it's still people who are uh, relatively small by, by modern standards community. Um, uh, so I'd say I'm just gonna, you're probably also wondering this. Let me explain it to you. Um, but also, B, we're still in an era where uh, uh, what we would call DIY culture, um, where it's expected most gamers are adapting and adjusting their games on the fly or as – with intentional design. So everyone's kind of a game designer as well as a player. And so this is a designer talking to other potential designers. Here's why I made these decisions. Um, so again, you see that kind of uh, uh, behind the scenes talk in a way that uh, you don't see very often. And also um, something you also don't see today related to that. Uh, there are sections of the book that have a writer subhead, uh, has an attribution. Uh, so, which basically is, if it's not, if the section doesn't have a writer sub, it's assumed it's being written by Kevin. So he's giving his colleagues who are writing for this credit, but rather than just a lump together credit in the front of the book, like we do generally nowadays, each section, oh, this person wrote that. Because again, you might see that person at a convention because it's a really small community. And you might have questions for that section. So now you know who wrote that section, who you can ask those questions of. So you can start to see kind of how the community has is is the way they exist and the way they collaborate and the way they uh work in this 81 space uh but um you still see lots of the remnants of that war game culture uh there's still 
they're still strong here. Uh, and the big one is acronyms. So many acronyms. Um, if there's more than – if there's two words jammed together, it gets an acronym. If there's three words, it definitely gets an acronym. Uh, so there's SDC, there's OCC, there's WP, there's ISP. Even some of the attributes have IQ and, and uh, superstructure things, PAV and it, EBA. Uh, and, and all of them are just thrown around and maybe defined once. Uh, and then it's just the acronym from that on, which if you're cramming a massive game into 60 pages of a comic book, I can understand the space considerations there. Uh, but again, it is very much from that wargaming conceit of, uh, of I've explained this once, and so therefore I'm going to abbreviate this. And also uh, things like acronyms bring a tight community together because it, it, it becomes a lexicon that all of you can share and communicate with that outsiders don't necessarily understand. It becomes opaque to them. Um, so it's, it's not quite gatekeeping, um, but it is certainly a, a way to kind of test if you have – frequent nerd cred you really understand what you're talking about is if you can use the acronyms in languages this is definitely the, the cultural touchstone we're talking about because this is again a small community of people who probably know each other so they don't need to have any more explanations then this is a convenient shorthand it's not meant to be an isolating decision but it does have the effect of particularly when you get into things like the character creation chapter it's just a word salad of acronyms um, there is one sentence on page 30 that is literally, quote, players with character occupations in LBA, EBA, or Commando can opt to join the experimental weapons divisions that have an IQ of 13 or above. It's, it's, it's just nonsense, right? <laughs> like, what's an LBA? What's the EBA? I don't even know what, you know, I know what IQ is, but only because culturally I understand that. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot. Um, uh, and, uh, the other thing that sets interesting about this time period is um, Traveler, to go back to one of our touchstones, is notorious for, the classic Traveler, notorious for being a game where you get you die in character creation. Uh, people who've been around the industry for a while know this kind of canard of uh, uh, Traveler's the only game where you die during your character creation, which I have often argued, no, Wraith's the only game where you always die in character creation, but that's either here or there. Um, the idea that randomization can really change how your character gets made is still very important in early 80s design. Uh, we saw this in Bunnings and Burrows, and we see this again here, where the idea that you roll 3D8s, 3D6, uh, and you put them in your character sheet, and that's your range. You don't arrange them to taste. You don't modify them. Uh, and Kevin actually goes an extra step and says, I feel this is the preferred way of doing things because people don't get to choose their inclinations when they are born. Um, the logic behind that is, is fuzzy and murky, but the overall point is that you play it where it lies. Another key example is this game is a game that features psionics, like I mentioned before, but you only have 50-50 chance. Um, uh, so, like, you have to roll percentile dice, and that tells you whether you know you have psionic powers or not. Uh, so you might have them and not know them. Uh, you might not have them, or you might have them and know them, but random chance is the only way you can't pick and choose one of those character concepts so random chance is still a really big part of this which means there are tables oh my there are tables meredith there are if so i can tables. if i can note you your note literally is oh dear god the tables <laughs> <laughs> there are tables um there there's like the character creation chapter there's Pages where it's just experience points, tables, and pictures, and that's all you get. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, but again, I mean, this is this is uh, the time period we're looking at. You know, um, your character was not something you would embodied. That wasn't the intent of the design. It was meant to be something like a unit in a war game where you play with the units you have, you try to make the best out of it. And simply because this is, in a lot of ways, a military scenario, right? Um, and and the, that influence is very explicit in this game. So, for example, um, uh, there's lots of very specific discrete weapons, and they all have a picture. Each weapon, every single weapon has a picture uh, of that kind of weapon. Um, and they're not just laser rifle, it's the LR-20 or the PBR-10. Um, these are very explicit concrete weapons um, 
that you pick up and use. Uh, and almost all of these uh, occupational classes are military types, some, some variant on soldier. Uh, might be alien soldier, might be psychic soldier, but the end of the day, making soldiers. So the idea isn't that I'm play. I want. I have this character in mind. I want to play. It's the okay. Well, I have rolled a character who's a psychic, so we now have a psychic on our team. Versus, oh well, I rolled a really buff uh, rifles guy, so that's the character we're going to play. Um, that's a very. It, it, it's not good or bad, but it's a very different style to kind of help understand why some of these decisions were made. Um, and then uh, near the ends. Uh, we get past the tables and, and the vehicles, and there's just so, so many. Um, you get to the actual background, and there's maybe three or four pages of the setting. Uh, it's uh, You get like a, about half a page on planet Gideon – sorry, about a page and a half of, of uh, Gideon E. Um, covers the map, uh, the um, flora and fauna, uh, how it came about, and that's basically it. Uh, it's it's definitely um, plot. Sorry, a setting light in that regard. Um, but compared to Buddies and Burrows, this is actually a relatively detailed setting. Uh, part of that is because um, this is the first game we've looked at that actually has an explicit setting chapter. It actually, says here is where you are and here's what what it's like. But Isabro didn't have even that. Dungeons and Dragons didn't have that. Uh, all of the setting was still implied through the mechanics. Um, this is the first game that I actually looked at that actually has here's an actual setting to play in. Uh, the second is that it still is doing what this other game's doing of having setting through gameplay. So when it's showing you things like here's the rovers, which is one of the alien races you can play. It's all written with the idea of these are characters you can play and NPCs that you can run into. Uh, but you learn a lot about what the world's like because the rovers live in it. And uh, some are with mechanoids. The mechanoids are explicitly uh, NPCs, but you see there's lots about the kinds of mechanoids there are and the vehicles they use and the weapons they use. It's all just stat blocks in a lot of ways. But by reading through the stat blocks, you start to learn what kinds of culture the mechanoids have. And each of the subsequent books would dig more and more into that. Um, and in the GM section, there's a kind of thing about here's what they're like, but it's almost all based around the military campaign. Um, so it's like here's their technology. Here's how they communicate. Here's um, – they have the following. And again, uh, I, 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 I've been talking about – there's these charts and, and stats and whatnot. It's complicated, but I kind of want to reiterate, Kevin has a wicked sense of humor that comes through all this. These are not dry recitations of facts. Um, uh, so like there's two points that one is when they're talking about the mechanoid uh, culture and spoilers for a game that is literally decades old, but um, uh, there's sections like, it, quote, it is important to realize that the earth colonies have been allowed to exist for the mechanoid's own sadistic amusement. This establishes a situation of cat and mouse, except the mouse is greatly underestimated and the cat is treacherously insane. You know, or um, there's a 10 point list of all mechanoids have the following they have environmental body armor, they have life support systems. And then, like, number nine is wicked tempers. <laughs> and number 10 is psychotic hatred of humans. That's on the equipment list, right? So there. It, Clearly, someone really enjoys this setting and loves this setting. What had to to make this game, um, and wants to share that that love and feeling. So this definitely feels like a friend who's your game master who's trying to explain the setting to you. Uh, so it, it, these books are fun to read as well. Um, they can get a little dry, but he tries to make them as entertaining as possible. Uh, so uh, the setting is, like I said, kind of. Explicit in some places, but also you learn about it. Um, but the other thing is that there is a plot to this game, not a meta plot, but a straight up plot that you just do not see except for outside of Savage Worlds games these days, um, which, which is this is what's going to happen, and this is how the game starts, and this is what's going to happen during the course of it. Uh, and also it's one of the few examples of early gaming where outside of Call of Duty, where the setting is you're probably going to die. Um, it's, it, humans are not going to survive this experience as, as written and 
that's something that even uh, in the introduction to the trilogy, uh, Kevin talks about that a lot of gamers kicked back against that uh, in 81. They didn't see, what's the point of playing if we're just going to die? The idea of the journey is the point doesn't really exist because, again, we're, we're still, I keep on back this, but we're still coming from wargaming. You have to win. Uh, and, you know, we, nowadays, we don't, we don't even think about tabletop role-playing games making you win, but the Tabletop role-playing games had win conditions in 81. That was believed how they were played. And so a game like this where the win condition is very unlikely seemed like it was actually unfair, and people would call games like this unfair, uh, even though the point of the game was that, of course, you're not going to be able to destroy the enemy. There's nothing else. There's two whole other books we have to get into. You know, you can't just win in the first book. Um, and so Kevin's making a, a, a rough grasp towards things like narrative arcs, and trying to establish a game where a certain tone and concept and ethos and aesthetic are coming through. It's an aesthetic that's very much coming from early age gaming, and it's an aesthetic that's imp implemented in ways that we today would not recognize as narrative as gaming, but you're starting to see the initial things of it. We saw a little bit in Bummies and Burrows too. Um, it's like, let's tweak the rules to make this setting work better and we're seeing more of that here it's just that in monies and burrows it was so obviously not a militaristic setting that the rules had to change pretty significantly we see that clearly in this one it's falling along in the wake of the trends of tabletop role-playing games so it's harder to see but when you start digging into the meat of it this is a story this is a story game um it's just a story game that it's hard to recognize in 2021, but in, in 1981, it was so radical that people actually were didn't like it. So it, it broke a lot of boundaries in a lot of ways, and we just don't talk about those the ways that it, it – again, it's, it's almost immediately eclipsed by two of the icons of the tabletop industry in the same year. So it almost kind of floats in the radar. It isn't until something like Rifts comes along much, much later that – or – when they get the Robotech license, um, those two things kind of really help push Palladium into a, a bigger spotlight down the road. But yeah, that is Mechano Invasion. It's, it's a lot of interesting stuff there. That's a lot of nuggets. Um, lots. lots and lots of nuggets. But that makes it very special. I mean, like, that's what's really cool about it. So thank you for going over that. Um, yeah, no problem. So we've gone through kind of like the um, guts of it. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about how this is um evolved i was thinking of the word i was like it's the pokemon thing um evolved um <laughs> wow from, <laughs> from the 80s don't, don't forget the, the the scientific idea of evolution no pokemon that, that's where you're <laughs> pokemon gotta yeah. catch them all um so speaking of catching them all um what uh how is that how is the history like the because we do have the listings on drive through um right. you know what because there is a trilogy right the trilogy comes in at some point um, which we can dive into a little bit more too. So um, we have two marks for that. So right. So um, uh, uh, the, the trilogy is first. Uh, all three of those books come out within about a, six months to a year of each other, um, and they're all pretty small. Um, like the, the actual combined trilogy came out later is like a two hundred ten page book. So these are very small games. Um, again, like Bunnies and Burrows, games usually didn't break 60 pages unless there was something very interesting going on. And usually if it did, they broke them into multiple books so that each of those books was still kind of small and easy to, to grab. Um, uh, so the Mechanoid Invasion was kind of its own thing. Um, and then uh, I believe how it works is that uh, Palladium Fantasy comes out, which is obviously unconnected. And then a lot of other small games pop up. You got uh, Ninja Super Spies, uh, uh, the, the Robotech um, license, uh, the Teenage Mutant Turtle license, um, which is a brief digression. is another interesting bit of history that we, licensed games are, are fascinating, but also hard to talk about because due to license, you can't get them anymore. Um, but the TMNT role-playing game was actually came, very much predates the cartoon. So this was a license before it became wildly popular. It was just a black and white comic. And a lot of the things that the tabletop game of TMNT puts in becomes later cartoon and eventually comic book canon um, in a similar way that uh, the West End Star Wars games did that, uh, the Athos Star Trek games. They actually created the canon that subsequent things built off of because tabletop games have to answer questions that tie-in media often doesn't. Um, so uh, Mechanoids really gets put on the back burner 
for a while. And then, of course, uh, Rifts becomes like the big house owns engine once all the licenses expire. Um, Rifts becomes the kitchen sink of, of Palladium. So you can have anything you want to in Rifts. Uh, you could have samurai, you could have uh, you know, giant robots, you can have cyber, cyberpunk stuff and put it all into one big setting and have it all there. So it makes a ton of sense why he did that. Uh, so in the early 90s, once Rifts uh, becomes a thing, um, he starts putting out source books. And the second source book, like the first one's like just stuff he couldn't fit into Rifts, really. Um, and then the second one is the Mechanoids again. So he, the Mechanoids that were in the trilogy then invade Rifts Earth. And uh, they are similar um, in the sense that Kevin is a smart cookie and did not recommission the art. So he just used the art he used in the original books and put them into the new book. So, of course, they're going to be similar in that respect. Um, and he also wrote a lot of this material, and he wants to reuse it. So he's not going to rewrite that material. Um, but uh, I believe uh, Sourcebook 2 assumes that the events of the Mechanoid Invasion didn't happen. So it's the what they invaded Rift's Earth instead of uh, Gideon E. And then when the trilogy, Invasion Trilogy comes out, he gives, like I said, those updated stat blocks to the idea of that if you wanted to bring that into uh, Rifts or another Palladium game, then you could have this version of Mechanoid Invasion also play out. Um, and then Mechanoid Invasions are pretty much now integrated into the Rifts continuity and kind of follow that along since. So um, it's another look at um, how that first game certainly had its stamp on subsequent games, but it's still not its own thing anymore. Awesome. All right. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to mention. Um, the other yeah. two books keep going over it. Um, uh, the second book is Journey, um, uh, which is uh, the human survivors are in a mechanoid mothership. Basically, uh, Gideon E is destroyed, and so some uh, human survivors are actually taken away on the mechanoid mothership, and they try to rebel, mm -hmm. uh, which fails. Um, but uh, it does introduce some actual magic and more science, and the psionic powers actually come into its own in that book. Mm -hmm. um, and then Homeworld is actually where the human survivors make it to the Mechanoid Homeworld mm -hmm. and try to finish the battle there um, and becomes kind of more of the same. And also, whoops, here's things like alignments that we forgot in previous books or wanted to refine. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's a pretty simple arc. You know, it's like, um, Aliens attack colony, aliens conduct a colony, aliens end up going to alien home or your humans go to alien home world. It's mm -hmm. it's not a complicated plot, but it's still an arc and it does each subsequent book requires a certain ending from the previous book, mm -hmm. which is so again, so explicitly a meta plot. It's fascinating that it doesn't come up more often in discussions of meta plot in the history of the RPG industry. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um all right, so we've talked about um, we've talked about Palladium, we've talked about Mechanoid, we've talked about the trilogy. Mm -hmm. um, so before we talk about how it influenced, I'm going to move our outline around. Um, yeah, because I can do that as a as as a co-host. Power. Uh, <laughs> um, wanted to talk about the design um, of it because it's different. It's really really and different. I I'm I'm curious because um, this is again one of the rare instances where Kevin is both the artist and the writer. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious what your thoughts are. I mean, there are additional writers and additional artists, but sure. there's a lot sure, of sure. both. So I'm curious what your thought is on that front. So when we look at like bunnies and burrows, right? Like the thing is, is like they look like sketches. Like they look like mm -hmm. someone like, which is fine, and I think that's really cool because it makes me get that like. Um, I'm trying to think of the word for it. It's a very like at home feeling like, because like, it's just, it's someone like sketching on a piece of paper. Um, and again, yeah. like that idea of like when you're around the table and like, I don't know about everybody else, but like for me, like I doodle um, when, sure. you know, like I'm doing that and that's how it feels. It feels like that, like you're at the table, you're doodling, uh, mm -hmm. which is really, really great. Um, with looking over the invasion, what is wild to me is it's the same type of look, right, as Bunnies and Burrows in that it's black and white. Like, mm -hmm. it's got the one, like, color cover, which is one singular color palette, um, which is interesting to me. It's, it's super, mm -hmm. super interesting. So, like, that didn't really change from right. the 70s. Um, what did change, though, is everything is inked. Like, it's it, it's mm -hmm. it, instead of it being doodles, it's 
it's actual like line work, um, mm. which is very, very interesting. And also it has like um, like graphs and stuff like that, like in terms of like how things look and like uh, almost blueprinty uh, would be the, mm -hmm. the, the coolest thing to, to say for it. Um, but yeah, it still maintains black and white, but it's evolved, right, from the 70s. It's not that not that sketch look anymore. Now it's like, okay, this is an actual like graphic piece. Um, and you can see that throughout too, because it still has Kevin's um, watermark on it. You know, he says at, you know, copyright 1982, mm -hmm. uh, which is very, very interesting. Uh, so, cause you don't see that a lot in newer books, a lot of times no. it's very rare when artists like our signature are on the actual piece. Um, yeah. I've seen it happen a couple times, like in Onyx Path books, like where it's just a super small signature, but it's not this like, boom, like, you know what I mean? Every single piece, which mm -hmm. is, it's very fascinating to me. Um, they also have the the comic, basically. I think that's a comic. Yeah. I would call that a comic, um, which is really cool because again, like, and it looks like a comic, like it's mm -hmm. got the, it's got the pointillism. It has, um, and, and it does maintain that black and white aspect. Uh, and it's cool in that. Um, and the font work is interesting too, because it's that, it gives me that that like 80s arcade vibe is like what it does. Yeah. It it's really, really shows that time. It shows that like, because th that was like the font, right? Of the 80s. And it really, really, really shows that um, throughout. And I love it. So it's just yeah, great. and just little things like um, the fact that the title's all in lowercase on the yeah. uh, title is again that kind of playing with the look and feel of the game and using the uh elements in front of it um to make sure the game more interesting um but on the flip side also it has literally the exact same mechanoid copy pasted four times on the cover yeah <laughs> it's like oh look it's a wave of them but they're identical so they the exact same thing i mean so it, it, cost cutting is obviously happening but you're right yeah. there's um it, it's it's clearly trying to evoke the comic books of the era, both in its look and again, it was printed in comic book size. So, I mean, yeah. it's trying to hit that market. And you're right, I think it does a good job of it. Yeah. I mean, like, even looking at like the character drawings too, what is very, very fascinating is like, so you have like, you know, this character, um, an Esper. And what's fascinating about it is like they have the lines to it. Like, this is their, you know, infrared scope this is their utility belt you know this is their lance this or this is their laser this is their holster this is their canteen and i think that's very cool because you don't see that a lot um in modern really it's just like this is this is a warrior this is what they look like um but what's cool is that if they take the time to break it down and be like these are the items and i think that's really mm -hmm. cool too like when designing your character because you'd say okay um experts have you know handheld communicators they have a utility belt they have these things like this is and of course like you can obviously use your imagination for whatever you want, but it's neat to see that broken down, um, yeah. especially, yeah, the communications engineer, completely different, completely different diagram. Um, they wear leather jackets. Uh, they, you know, they have a long range wideband radio. And I think that's neat. Uh, it's something I've never seen personally. So. And, and some, a minor point, but um, again, this is still a game that's heavily inspired by military gaming. And yet, 481, a surprising amount of women characters are presented yes. in this. A lot. A lot, yeah. a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. I mean, definitely, because you don't... Like, the very again, first in-character person you see is a woman. Yep, very first one, which is very... It's different. Right? Like, it's mm -hmm. obviously now it's... We have everybody, which is right. great. Um, and working towards definitely making it even more inclusive. But, mm -hmm. yeah, I just found that... I found that kind of interesting like i was like oh okay like i did not expect that from an 80s book so that was yeah. a really nice surprise um but yeah uh the layout is for the rest of it is very much the same it has that like two column look to it uh that a lot uh we still use right like yeah. we still use that it's what works um and is what is awesome and yeah, it's just it it's it's very like I know it's supposed to be military, but like I said and I mentioned, it's very comic y. Like mm -hmm. comic book y right. uh would be the best way to put it because there's comic strips and just the way that it's designed, it's just it's fascinating to me. Um, you know, and but like I said, with that very basic cover, it's like it's very, very basic. There's nothing really um outstanding or like, you know, 
ridiculous art. It's simple, but it's upgraded. So it's 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 very cool to see that from the 70s to the 80s. Yeah, and, and again, I mean, you talk about these boroughs. This is only five years later. Yeah. Um, and it's a similar thing. It, it, it's a one person making this. Um, even slightly less uh, circumstances because Kevin's doing this all from scratch as opposed to selling it to an established company. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the the quality bar visually, you're right, is just already jumped pretty high in just five years. Right. And that's that's so cool to me mm-hmm. um, that like how much has evolved. And again, a rarity of uh, someone writing, developing and doing their artwork like that's yeah that's 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 wild to me I, I i think i have met maybe three other people in my life in this industry that do all three uh very very rarely does that happen so that's that's something very cool to note and i want to keep noting is that kevin did this yes with other writers yes with other artists but mostly by himself and that's yeah, and wild that, you're right you're right that, that is i mean outside of um, really tiny indie game. And a lot of ways, this is a tiny indie game. Like, you know, this is the kind of game that nowadays would be on itch.io or would be like a $3 download on Drive to RPG, right. you know? Um, uh, but the fact that this, again, the, the, if you talk about the quality bar is so high, um, it, it's just impressive for the time period and also even now, frankly. Some of yeah. the art, you know, like you put it in a book now and if, you, if, you, if, if someone colored it, it would be just fine in a book now. Right, which is, again, like so, so wild. Huh. So that is my take on design. So thank you. I think, yeah, thank mm-hmm. you. Um, so I think that um, in in before we close, talking about how that's influenced the industry a little bit more is I think a good way to to end that because I mean like we want to talk. We've talked about how it's influenced you know the 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 time frame at that time, but like now where we are yeah. now, how is that? Uh- Done that. Uh, I mean, obviously, it has influenced um, directly uh, Rifts, which is still, again, one of the longest running uh, uh, properties that is still owned by the same company and created by the same people. Um, I mean, frankly, there just aren't many properties that are so consistently creatively managed that mm-hmm. length. Um, and so many, certainly, I mean, companies that do that. Um, I mean, Flying Buffalo was the longest, but now um, th- th- can they catch up at, at this point? Yeah. Um, so, that was an influence. Um, it's also uh, was an influence uh, the idea of lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of specialized skills and classes. Um, the idea that you don't have just two or three classes and you don't need any skills, but rather that everything distinctive about your character can be articulated, and the different ways those can be shuffled together presents a whole new way of game playing. Right. Um, that's really starting to take root uh, in a game like this. Uh, mm-hmm. And again, lots of playing games. Their, their bread and butter is you have those OCCs and sometimes dozens and dozens and dozens of OCCs come out of it, but that's the gameplay. Mm-hmm. And there's still uh, a lot of that can be learned from looking at, well, why are these different gameplays distinctive? The fact that Kevin had 17 and boiled it down to seven for that first book shows that it's he's not just throwing everything at the wall. He's clearly thinking very carefully about what play styles are viable mm-hmm. and interesting and compelling and then presenting only those. So even though it looks like we have lots of classes, he's clearly thought about why he's brought those out. Right. Um, and uh, a quick shout out to a non uh, one bookshelf thing, but I actually did for uh, the extra credits channel. I did a breakdown of why classes, uh, how to design a class. Um, and I did that script before I read this and I was able to so okay, I can see, a lot of very intentional class design happening here. Mm-hmm. He tried very hard to make sure each of those was compelling but interesting in their own rights. And clearly with an eye towards each person will play one of these. I mean, yeah. that, that's implicit, but it's just pretty heavily – if you have seven of those, if you probably have seven nine players. That was another thing I actually even talked about a little bit was um, in the 1780s, player groups are much larger. Yeah. Um, uh, right these days, four to six is pretty common group size. Um, then uh, nine, 10, 12 people at a table was not uncommon. Um, mm-hmm. So you had to have a wide variety of playable classes because you all have a lot of people at the table uh, right. and they all need to have their own way of kind of contributing. Um, so, yeah, so I think those are kind of some key pieces uh, that um, Palladium in general, but Mechanoid specifically brought to the industry in 81. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah, and what an impact it made. That's it's wild. Yeah. I love learning it's... about this stuff. So <laughs> it's really, really cool. Um, I think it's really, really awesome. So all right. Cool. Do you have any like closing remarks or anything else you want to say? Or we've we've covered a lot of ground today. 
We have. Um, I, I think one thing I want to talk about is um, what we're going to do next month. What are we going to do next month? Uh, next month, I want to dig into Time Master, uh, which was created in 84. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it, it was really created by Pace Setter. And so it's coming out after those other big tier games are coming out. Mm -hmm. um, it is a time travel game. Uh, oh. It has been re-released by Goblinoid Games. So we're going to look at one that has all new art. So the art's going to be something that we're we'll going to have a, a trickier conversation around, I think. Okay. Um, uh, but uh, it is one of the first examples of a time travel game, and it has some really interesting ideas on how to do time travel. So Okay, you can, cool. You can I'm, dig into. I'm interested. Yeah, I'm already interested. I'm already into it. Um, well, awesome. And yeah, and now these are moved to YouTube. Uh, which mm -hmm. is really, really awesome. So you can watch it at yep. your own convenience, which is really great. Um, we've moved a lot of our shows over to YouTube uh, and that has been going well so far. Um, but yeah, so keep an eye out next month uh, as Eddie and I come back to it uh, and we'll do our outros. Eddie, <laughs> where can people find you? Um, people can find me at uh, pugsteady.com. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at pugsteady. That's uh, P-U-G-S-T-E-A-D-Y. Um, uh, and if you want to check out my own work, uh, you can check it out either at theonyxpath.com or at realmsofpugmire.com. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, if you have questions about uh, Mechanoid Invasion or Bunnies and Burrows or some other games that maybe don't get talked about a lot, mm -hmm. chat with me online. Yeah. Chat on the internet which is Tell awesome. Internet. Yeah, internet's great. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Meredith Gerber. I'm the Century Publisher Relations Rep at Drive Through RPG, and you can find me over at Meredith Gerber pretty much everywhere. Uh, and yeah, come say hi, come hang out. Uh, we love chit-chatting. So yeah, do. awesome. And then of course, special thanks to Lisa, who is great and amazing. Lisa. Yeah, Lisa's the best. And I need everyone to understand that. Um, Lisa is also our, yes, our Dungeon Masters Guild brand manager as well. Um, and you'll be seeing Lisa coming up in some stuff uh, we can't talk about yet, but we're really excited. So it's going to be really <laughs> awesome. Um, in some things. <laughs> yes, Lisa's in some stuff. Um, but yeah, so thank you so much for joining us and we will see you next time. Bye. -bye. Bye.